will shake me. No enemy will intimidate me. You don't fix human failures by giving the humans more money. You fix human failures by getting new humans to do the job. Any missile or drone strike, any critical incident in the energy system could lead to a nuclear disaster. A day like that must never come. Hello, everyone. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. If nothing else, we here at America Decides know how to count and read a map. So here you go. 41 days to Election Day. Not incidentally, voting has already begun in some states. Vice President Harris was in Pittsburgh today. Former President Trump in North Carolina. The Vice President unveiled new economic proposals in her fourth trip to Western Pennsylvania since launching her campaign. Trump pushed as you might expect, his America First agenda, doing so at a plumbing manufacturing plant just outside of Charlotte, his second visit to North Carolina in the last five days. And we are learning about renewed threats and assassination plots against the former president from Iran. Trump and his campaign have been briefed on this topic by U.S. intelligence officials. That is where we start tonight. And our Scott McFarland joins us from Capitol Hill. Scott, catch us up on the latest regarding Iran and these threats. Yeah, the Trump campaign confirms and actually reported first last night that their team and the former president have been briefed by the Office of Director of National Intelligence about potential Iranian plots to assassinate him and to destabilize American politics at this inflection point with about a month and a half until Election Day. This comes after two assassination attempts over the past two and a half months, but there's been no indication of any connective tissue whatsoever between those two attempts and Iran. But it also is not happening in a vacuum, is it, Major? It's happening amid this concern the U.S. Secret Service needs more money, needs more manpower, needs better equipment, better training, better communications to deal with these threats against Donald Trump and their other protectees. And one note from a newly issued U.S. Senate report came out at 5 a.m. Eastern time today that there was intelligence received just ahead of Donald Trump's Butler rally about a possible threat, a destabilizing threat. The July 13th Butler rally major was the first one involving a post-president Donald Trump in which he got a counter sniper team assigned. That counter sniper team in Butler, Pennsylvania may very well have saved his life and many other lives that day. There may be some connective tissue between the deployment of that counter sniper team July 13th and the threats being received ahead of time. Scott, I know you have an interview with one of the lawmakers most interested in boosting funding for the Secret Service. We'll get to that in a second, but I want to play for our audience some sound from former President Trump today about what he regards as maybe a lack of emphasis by the Biden administration to Iran about the threats around him and what he might do if he were similarly positioned? Let's listen. If I were the president, I would inform the threatening country, in this case Iran, that if you do anything to harm this person, we are going to blow your largest cities and the country itself to smithereens. We're going to blow it to smithereens. You can't do that. Scott, are those sentiments shared in any way that you can detect on Capitol Hill by Trump supporting Republicans? What we heard out of Trump supporting Republicans today on this topic was about the need to more robustly protect Donald Trump. They've been making this argument that he needs the same level of protection he would have had when he was president and that President Biden enjoys right now. And to a degree, that argument is succeeding. The U.S. House, as the evening began here in Washington, passed a spending bill that includes more than $200 million for the Secret Service to better protect its protectees. What's more, a bill to make equal the protections given to presidential candidates and the president passed overwhelmingly, unanimously in the U.S. House, and then unanimously, by unanimous consent, in the U.S. Senate. Something passing unanimously this close to an election is unheard of. So there seems to be some unanimity to the need and the idea here that there is a need to get more protection from Donald Trump, Vice President Harris, and the other protectees in this moment, in this moment of potential international interference. Take a listen to one of the sponsors of the House bill, Mike Lawler, first-term Republican from New York. It ensures that the Secret Service provide the same level of protection for the former president as they do for President Biden, which, given the fact that 
either Donald Trump or Kamala Harris is going to be president of the United States come January, it is imperative that we ensure their safety and well-being and that the same level of protective detail is provided, especially after uh, President Trump uh, was a uh, victim of not one but two assassination attempts. And Major, let me just button up a few loose threads here. The defendant in that alleged second assassination attempt, Ryan Ruth, appears in court Monday to face formal charges. And oh, by the way, Donald Trump has on the schedule a trip back to Butler, Pennsylvania, October 5th. Scott McFarland on Capitol Hill. Thank you, as always. Robert Costa and Nancy Cordes join us now. Robert is in Mint Hill, North Carolina. Nancy is in Pittsburgh. So, Nancy, I want to start with you. Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania, yet again for Vice President Harris. Not only an emphasis geographically, but there's some new economic proposals that were dis distributed today. Tell us about those. Right. So she talked about wanting to promote innovation in manufacturing, but her main focus here in Pittsburgh in this battleground state major was her overarching economic philosophy, trying to lay out for a public uh, that is still learning about her and her proposals uh, exactly how she would uh, address economic challenges as president of the United States. So she argued that she is a pragmatist, that she would not be guided by ideology alone, and that she would take great ideas from all corners. Essentially, Major, what she's trying to do is peel off the labels that Donald Trump has been trying to stick on her, that she's a socialist, that she's a capitalist. He even called her yesterday a tax queen. She's arguing that she actually wants to cut taxes for the middle class, that she wants to provide more assistance to startup businesses, to uh, people who are trying to buy their first home. And uh, she's arguing that she, she isn't guided by uh, liberal principles solely when it comes to the economy, that she'll take ideas, if they're good ones, wherever they come from, and that she will uh, commit to trial and error until she gets it right. Uh, Robert Costa, turning to you in North Carolina. The Trump message on the economy not only trying to label Kamala Harris, but saying there has already been a certain amount of trial and error. Major, great to be with you from the battleground, North Carolina. I was covering former President Donald Trump earlier today at a manufacturing site outside of Charlotte in the Charlotte region. And it's evident that he's coming back to his core themes from the 2016 campaign and the 2020 campaign in this final stretch in 2024. He's talking about economic nationalism, about putting forward tariffs on American corporations who choose to move abroad for manufacturing or for any kind of business purpose, and having punitive tariffs be at the core of his economic argument. And it's winning some support, especially among Republicans in North Carolina and elsewhere, who like to see that Trump-style economic approach taken, not just to talk about tax cuts, but to talk about appealing to working voters by putting trade front and center. And that's what makes Trump so different than most traditional Republicans who usually would only talk about extending the Trump tax cut. Trump sees an opportunity to cut into the Democratic base, especially among union members in the South and the industrial Midwest, by focusing once again on trade. And Robert, uh, we talk frequently with you and enjoyably about your life growing up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania. I know this is not necessarily your bailiwick, but I just want to know what you think about or what the Trump campaign regards as Harris's emphasis on Western Pennsylvania. Harris knows that, and this is based on my conversations with her advisors and her top strategists, that she needs enormous turnout in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh because there is an expectation on the Democratic side that Trump's going to get big turnout in Western Pennsylvania. By focusing on things like antitrust issues, going after big corporations, by talking about not taxing on tips, uh, echoing the Trump position, by talking about working people, locking arms with union leaders like Sean Fain and others, Harris is trying to make sure that Trump's not going to walk away with that quiet, centrist union vote in places like Western Pennsylvania. So her going to Western Pennsylvania isn't some kind of belief that she's going to win all regions in Pennsylvania, especially that one, but that she needs to counter Trump on immigration, on the economy in that part of the state. Because if she can run up the score in Philadelphia and keep him relatively muted and soft in some counties in western Pennsylvania, especially those collars around Pittsburgh, 
then she can win the state. And it's very hard when you talk to Harris people for her to have a map to the White House that doesn't run through Pennsylvania. And if, she, if it doesn't run through Pennsylvania, it's going to almost have to run through North Carolina and Georgia. And that's why you see such an emphasis on those states as well. Nancy, turning to you about another question of geography, the vice president is considering, we are led to believe, a visit to the U.S.-Mexico border. She is. And believe it or not, Major, this would be her first visit to the border since 2021. This has uh, always been a sticky issue for her. Obviously, Republicans are going after her on this issue now. Our polling shows uh, that she trails Trump by double digits when it comes to handling of immigration. Uh, but she's going into the belly of the beast. She's going to be uh, holding a campaign event near the border in Arizona on Friday. Uh, and she's going to argue that uh, actually uh, the number of, of border crossings has dropped sharply in the past few months since the Biden administration, of which she is a part, imposed a tough new asylum policy. And she's going to argue that it was actually Trump who um, brought an end to what would have been a major bipartisan achievement on Capitol Hill, a big new compromise immigration bill. And so uh, it'll be very interesting to watch the optics and also to listen to what she has to say in Arizona as she works to defuse which, something that has been uh, really one of her biggest and most difficult issues to tackle on the campaign trail. And Robert, picking up on that point, economics and immigration seem to be the core messages as Trump looks toward the finish line. Oh, there's no doubt about it. And as you know, Major, there's such a history of this in both parties and seeing how these issues are intertwined. Because when you go to a union hall, as you have many times and I have many times, you often meet workers uh, who say that immigration levels put aside undocumented migrants, legal immigration levels, many workers have told me in the past few decades, they would like to see them limited in some way, capped or lowered. Because the idea among many working Americans that you're in any way increasing the working population, especially for some of these industrial jobs, that's competition. They want to make sure they're not facing more competition in a tough economic atmosphere. So that's why immigration in the economy in places like North Carolina and western Pennsylvania and all parts of the country are so often linked together because working people who are those are the real swing voters in my view this time around they link those issues they don't see them as kind of a separate fund they don't see the discussion about the border as some kind of individual singular policy fight it's part of the economic fight and how they feel economic pain and how they cast responsibility for it whether it's positive or negative Robert Costa and Nancy Cordes as always thank you very much and a quick programming note. Join us here on CBS News 24-7 early. And by early, I mean 4 p.m. Eastern on October 1st for our special vice presidential debate edition of America Decides Live from New York. CBS News, as you might have heard, will moderate the only vice presidential debate, and we will bring you coverage on that debate all evening long. Now to the Middle East, where the military intercepted, the Israeli military intercepted a missile launched from Lebanon into central Israel. This happened Wednesday morning. Chris Livesay has more from Tel Aviv. Well, in a major escalation, Hezbollah fired a surface-to-surface -surface missile in the Tel Aviv area, something that they have never done before. Hezbollah said it was aiming at the Mossad. That's Israel's foreign intelligence. They also said it was in, in retaliation for a week of just outright calamity for the Iran-backed group, starting with those exploding pagers and beepers, followed by the targeting killing of its military leadership, and now these airstrikes concentrated in the south of Lebanon. Now, the big fear is that Hezbollah's backers, Iran, will join the fight and that the U.S. could get dragged in as well to help its ally, Israel. So the Biden administration is working on a new diplomatic solution for a pause in the fighting, both in Lebanon and in, in uh, Gaza, to resuscitate those, those otherwise failed negotiations to release the hostages in exchange for a, a ceasefire. That's according to Reuters and Axios. But in the meantime, Israel is keen to keep up the momentum. And now there are talks within the military about escalating this into a ground invasion 
in Lebanon. So today, the chief of Israel's Northern Command said, quote, we need to change the security situation. We need to be very strongly prepared to enter Lebanon in a ground maneuver. Major. Chris Livesay, thank you very much. Here's a question. Can Vice President Harris follow in President Biden's footsteps and keep Georgia blue in 2024? We'll take a look at our latest numbers out of Georgia. That's next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Stop me if you've heard this before. The presidential race is very close in Georgia. How close? Well, a new, brand new CBS News poll finds former President Trump two points ahead of Vice President Harris. As you might recall, Georgia narrowly went blue for the first time in decades in 2020. Our CBS News Deputy Director of Elections and Data Analytics, Kabir Khanna, joins us now. Kabir, break down the numbers for us. Well, Major, I'm focused on Georgia this week for two reasons. One is that it has one of the biggest electoral halls among the battleground states, second only to Pennsylvania. And also, as you said, it's a very competitive state these days. We have Trump with a two-point edge that's well within the margin of error. One cool thing that we can do with the CBS News Battleground Tracker that you won't get in a typical poll is look at data at a much more granular level. What I've done here is produced an estimate of Harris's support and Trump's support in each of Georgia's 159 counties. And what you'll see is a familiar pattern. Donald Trump is running up the score in smaller rural counties in the southeast and northwest of the state while Harris is doing better around major cities. Let me point your attention to one set of counties in particular, and that's the Atlanta metro area and the suburbs around Atlanta. You may remember this was crucial to Biden's win in 2020. He ran up the score in Atlanta, and he saw a shift to the left of a few points in Atlanta's diverse growing suburbs. What we find today is that Harris is winning these counties, but she's not quite meeting those margins that Joe Biden saw in 2020. Let me give you one example. If we go to DeKalb County, we currently estimate that Harris is at 76% support there. So she's winning it handily by three to one. But by comparison, Joe Biden won this county, which is full of black voters, by 84%. So in a race this close, a lot of factors can flip the result from small shifts in turnout to small shifts in support. If Harris were to get a little bit closer to Biden's numbers in 2020, including matching his support with black voters who make up a third of the electorate, she would pull even statewide major. And Kabir, what did we find in terms of voter importance on issues or the idea about how secure the election will be in Georgia writ large? So we see a familiar dynamic here. Um, both the economy and democracy are top concerns among voters in this state. First of all, on the economy, Georgia voters are still feeling the effects of inflation. Many feel that they're worse off than they were before the COVID pandemic. Many feel that housing in their part of the state is unaffordable. And voters who feel worse off are supporting Donald Trump in large numbers. That's a big part of why he has that edge statewide. At the same time, as you can see here, almost as many voters statewide say they're very concerned about whether the U.S. will have a functioning democracy when they think about the next few years. This group is helping keep Harris competitive statewide. They're going for her by eight points. We also asked folks what they thought about the new rules that the Georgia Election Board has voted on, including a requirement to hand count ballots on election night. While well, most people feel that this will cause delays in finding out who wins Georgia, and they might be onto something. Rule changes aside, we should be very patient in finding out who wins a state like this when it's such a tight margin, Major. Kabir Khanna, thank you very, very much. Uh, it was the greatest honor in the world sitting behind the Resolute desk as President of the United States, but, but uh, I, and I loved it, but it sounds it corny, but I love my country more. President Biden's view of his decision to step aside and why he thinks Vice President Harris is the best woman for the job. That's coming up next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. President Biden went on the airwaves to advocate for the vice president. That's no real surprise. He was asked, this is kind of interesting, what advice he gave her. Be yourself. Mm -hmm. Look, she is smart as hell, number one. Yeah. She's tough. 
She was a first-rate prosecutor. She is a United States senator of significant consequence. And as vice president, there wasn't a single thing that I did that she couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to delegate her responsibility on everything from foreign policy to domestic policy. We're bringing our political panel, Nancy Cook and Sabrina Rodriguez. Nancy is a senior national political correspondent for Bloomberg News. Sabrina is a national politics reporter for The Washington Post. So we just brought our audience brand new numbers from Georgia. We have brand new sound from the vice president in an interview that she did earlier today with Stephanie Rule at MSNBC. They released one clip about that from that interview. It's about tariffs. Let's take a look at that. Tariffs aren't unique to President Trump. President Biden has tariffs in place. He's actually looking to potentially implement more. Where do you come out on? Is there a good tariff, a bad tariff? I, well, part of it is you don't just throw around the idea of just tariffs across the board, and that's part of the problem with Donald Trump. I, frankly, I, I'm going to, and I say this in all sincerity, I, he's just not very serious about how he thinks about some of these issues. So, your reaction, Nancy Cook, you have a kind of an expertise built out over a career in the economic sphere and po politics. Economics, we all know, will be a big part of this. Democrats are asking, urging the vice president to sharpen her economic message, get more specific, get more, lean into it a little bit more. This is part of that conversation, clearly. Yeah, I mean, she didn't really answer the question. Um, and she, she certainly, and, and the Biden administration, to be fair, has kept the Trump tariffs in place and even doubled down on some of them. And so what I've seen her doing is she didn't answer the question. What she did was instead attack Trump. And, and that's what we saw with her doing in the debate as well. She said that he wasn't serious, sort of called into question his temperament and character. And that has really been her MO in this presidential race. Instead of sort of trying to make as much of a policy contrast, particularly on economic issues. She has been going after him personally, after his, you know, felony convictions, after his behavior, his temperament, and that's what we saw her do in that interview. To be fair, this afternoon, late this afternoon, her campaign did release an 86-page economic blueprint. I have not had the chance to look through the whole thing. <laughs> all 86 pages. Some, some light bedtime reading. Right. And so I do think they are trying to sort of put a little bit more detail behind some of her economic ideas, um, just because people are demanding it. Right. But, but she also, really, her message is that Trump is not fit to be president, and that's what she's going to keep hammering home. Sabrina, this brings up an interesting point, because when you talk to Trump folks, as I do, and I know you do, all of us do at this table, they will say, look, she doesn't answer the questions put to her, and she constantly harangues former President Trump, and voters still don't know who she is or what she is. Is that a strategy they can rely on going forward? I mean, it's what they've leaned on so far. And, and the reality is, when you talk to the Harris campaign folks, they'll bring up, well, does he really answer the question? Does he really get into, you know, the nuts and bolts of what exactly he would do in terms of the economy? He but the fact is, Trump is a known commodity. Harris isn't. And the polling data shows that. People are less certain about what she is or what her intentions are or what her sort of foundational principles are. Dislike or like Trump, people have a pretty good sense of those. Oh, no question about it. I mean, they're really leaning into the, she needs to be introducing herself to the American people. She needs to be showing that she takes these issues seriously. And part of her messaging on the economy has been sort of leaning into a personal appeal as well, talking about, well, I can actually provide for you because I understand you. And her talking about coming up in the middle class and really understanding, you know, workers and understanding that struggle in a way that Donald Trump doesn't. And we do see that from when she, you know, joined the race, she has improved significantly on the economy. I in mean, relationship to former President Trump, yes. Absolutely. The gap has narrowed. He's still leading, but the gap has narrowed. The gap has narrowed, which is a positive for her. And what, what her campaign is sort of saying is the more she talks about it, the better she is doing on this. And, and more so that you talk to voters and they're becoming increasingly familiar with her. But there is still that doubt because in part, I mean, Kamala Harris has a background as a politician, as a prosecutor, and Donald Trump does have this branding that has worked well for him of this businessman, this successful you know, businessman persona that can run this country like a business. And that does appeal with a lot of people. Nancy, in our Georgia data, one of the questions we asked was, have wages kept up with inflation? Mm -hmm. the vast majority of people in Georgia said no. Mm -hmm. Even though statistically, mm -hmm. it's somewhat close. Not that wages have overstripped and compensated in all respects for inflation, but it's much closer than people perceive. Still an advantage for Trump. 
Yeah, that remains really the big the big problem for Harris is that even though several markers of the economy are doing much better, you know, we saw the Federal Reserve cut interest rates last week. Um, you know, inflation is abating. Uh, people's wages have seen an increase. Unemployment remains low. People still feel bad about the economy, even if their own personal economic picture is not horrible. Um, and, and that sort of pessimistic sense of the economy has pervaded this election. And I think definitely is why the race is so close and why Trump is running so neck and neck with Harris. Sabrina, the uh, so-called vibe session, the idea <laughs> that even though you might be personally, and our data shows this nationally, people feel, I'm, I'm okay, but I'm pessimistic about the future. That's sort of the disconnect. 100%. I mean, if we all collectively had a dollar for every time we talked to someone that said, <laughs> you know, I don't like the way he speaks, but, but right. or, you know, I'm not voting for him because I think he's a great person, but, and then the answer afterwards is about the economy. Um, I mean, that is, that is the number one thing that she needs to penetrate between now and election day, is really selling herself as, I'm a good person and I can handle the economy. And that's the challenge she has that, that really lies ahead and that Donald Trump still gets to drive home, regardless of what he says, regardless of who he offends, um, is still that perception that he understands and that he is actually going to, to improve the economy. And that path to breaking through might begin with answering the question posed to you in the first place. Nancy Cook and Sabrina <laughs> Rodriguez, that's not your problem. You do it exceptionally <laughs> well. Kamala Harris might want to think about that. President of Finland pledges more support for Ukraine. Our Ouija Jang one-on-one -on -one interview. That's next, right here on America Decide. Welcome back to America Decides. Ukrainian President Zelensky will be in Washington tomorrow with meetings with President Biden and Vice President Harris on his schedule, also meeting probably with some lawmakers. All this after he addressed the General Assembly today. Here's a bit of what President Zelensky said. It not only ignores reality, but also gives Putin the political space to continue the war and pressure the world to bring more nations under control. Any parallel or alternative attempts to seek peace are, in fact, efforts to achieve a law instead of an end to the war. Our Ouija Jang is covering the General Assembly. Earlier today, she spoke to the leader of one of NATO's newest member countries, Finland, and President Alexander Stubb. Let's listen. First, I want to ask you, since Finland joined NATO, do your people feel safer? How has the level of reassurance changed? Well, we do feel safer, but the truth is that we also have a very strong defense ourselves, and that's why we became NATO members extremely fast. We have one of the largest militaries in Europe, and I think NATO wanted us because if you double your border with Russia, it's better to have a country that is quite serious about its defense. We feel very secure and safe, no problem. What can you tell us about the two NATO bases that are reportedly uh, in Finland? Well, what we're trying to do right now is to integrate ourselves into NATO. And that means that, first of all, we are under Norfolk, together with the other Nordic countries. And then we have two components. One is a land component, and the other one are these FLFs, Forward Land Forces. Uh, and we haven't decided yet where they're going to go, but we're talking more on a rotational basis. So we're not talking about a base with 5,000 soldiers. Uh, we are talking, you know, of tens of, of officers. And then we look at it, how it is structured within the next year or two. Obviously, uh, we heard from President Zelensky today. He continues to call for NATO allies to support his request to use long-range missiles deeper into Russia. You agree with him that that is the right approach. What is your message to President Biden, who has so far been resistant? My message to all of our allies is to allow, allow Ukraine to fight this war against Russia with both hands. Now it has one hand behind its back. Finland has absolutely no restrictions on what kind of weapons and which range uh, Ukraine can use in Russia, as long as two things are met. It's for defense purposes and it is within the framework of international law. So I am actually quite hopeful that when Zelensky presents his victory plan to President Joe Biden tomorrow, there should be hopefully some news uh, that gives uh, a little alleviation to the way in which Ukraine is fighting the war. Have you personally had a conversation with President Biden about that? Uh, I haven't about this, no. I've 
talk with him about many other things, but I did speak about this particular issue uh, with uh, both uh, Zelensky and in passing with uh, Foreign Secretary, Secretary of State uh, Blinken. And then finally, just today, President Biden, um, during an interview, warned that if the former president, Donald Trump, were to win in November, that would be the end of NATO. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't take issue in the American elections. I am in no position to do that. And I, as president of Finland, will get along with whichever president is selected for the United States. I do believe that the United States will stay committed to NATO and to Europe, because if it wants to retain its position, maintain its position as a superpower, it needs allies, and 32 of those allies are in NATO. But you have heard what the former president has said before about NATO. Do you take any of it, you know, seriously? Well, I take at least one thing very seriously, uh, and that is uh, defense expenditure. And I think he's been right on that. So he has, in many ways, with his language, which is quite rough at times, uh, forced a lot of the allies to increase their defense um, spending up to 2%. Remember that in 2014, there were only three allies that reached that goal. Now we're 23. So on that particular issue, I think he's right. Uh, and I hope that were he to be elected again, uh, he would see the benefit uh, of the alliance, not least in keeping Europe secure and also with his ambitions that he might have in uh, the Pacific. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank Appreciate you. your time. California is seen as a leader when it comes to progressive policy. So why are some California Democrats taking money from big oil and voting against some environmental laws? That's next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. While appearing at the UN General Assembly yesterday, President Biden touted his administration's work on addressing climate change. In California, lawmakers have often been ahead of the federal government when it comes to pushing climate policy, although they have not always been aligned on this substantive issue. CBS News California investigative correspondent Julie Watts joins us now from right outside the Capitol in Sacramento. It's good to see you, Julie. If there's any state and I'm a native Californian, I know a little bit about this, where elected officials and the public are more or less aligned on the issue of climate change, it's California. Isn't that correct? Yeah, absolutely. You know, polling shows that the majority of Californians are concerned about climate change, and you'd be hard-pressed to find someone in that building who would identify as a climate denier, at least an elected official in that building who would identify as a climate denier. But that does not mean that California lawmakers vote in favor of environmental legislation 100% of the time. In fact, we recently found uh, about 27% of votes from Democratic lawmakers in California's capital were against environmental legislation. And what would be the reasons for these lawmakers, in particular the Democrats you just mentioned, to either be against or not embracing of all manner of climate legislation? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. In some cases, they just withhold their vote. They don't vote against. That's considered a polite no here in California. So, I mean, Major, you know this, but, you know, folks at home may not. California is a leader, obviously, in environmental uh, policies and in green energy policies. A lot of what they are debating in D.C. is already law here in California. Cap and trade, for instance, has been law here for years, right? So the policies being debated inside California's capital, those are often novel, right? They're uh, untested in some ways. And so there is concern among California lawmakers that there may be unintended consequences for moving too fast. They point to gas prices, which are the highest in the nation here in California, in part because of some of our environmental legislation. And they also point to jobs. This comes as a surprise to many, but California is among the largest oil producers and refiners in the country. And that accounts for a lot of jobs. So we track down a couple of the lawmakers that are most often associated with the oil and gas industry, and we asked them to explain their votes. Here's what they said. How do you explain your vote on these bills? Well, for me, I always look at the unintended consequences. Not every community can afford 
whatever policy we pass out here, not because they don't want to or they're climate deniers, it's because they just can't afford it. What do you say to your constituents who support climate change legislation, who want to reduce CO2 levels, and who see that you vote against these bills that have been billed as climate change reducers? I'd say I'm on the same page as they are. I want to reduce carbon emissions. I am a believer of climate change, but we as legislators have to look at issues from all sides. We have to think about what's going to, you know, keep our economy going, what's going to keep uh, people employed. So you can see economy is certainly top of mind inside this building and for many California voters right now. There is an old saying in our business, Julie, you know it well, follow the money. Is it true that when you were looking into this, you discover that Democrats, maybe to your surprise or maybe to our audience's surprise, with some regularity, accept money from the fossil fuel industry? Yeah, you know, overall, and I actually was surprised to find this, overall, California Democrats get more money from oil and gas than Republicans do in California. And that is not the case in Congress, right? That's unique to California. Now. It's likely because we have so many more Democrats here in California. We've got a Democratic supermajority. So just the sheer numbers, when you total it all, account for more money. But what's really interesting is we wanted to know, is that why they're voting against environmental legislation? So we analyzed, with the help of CalMatters and their digital democracy database, we analyzed more than 6,000 bill positions on over 100 bills related to oil and gas. And we looked at how everybody voted in every committee and on the floor. And we found there was not really a correlation between between money and votes in favor of oil and gas. In fact, in some cases, people who did get money from oil and gas voted against uh, their interests 100% of the time. So then we looked deeper at some of the other lobbies here in, Ca in California, and I know you know this, but labor is probably the strongest influence inside California's capital, the labor unions, that is. Uh, Stick with me here, Major. Uh, recently, we were looking at uh, different studies analyzing how much the um, jobs pay here, right? Fossil fuel jobs, according to recent surveys, pay more and have better benefits in California than uh, many of the clean energy jobs do. That also is not the case across the rest of the country. That's the case here. So. You've got labor who are very supportive of the oil and gas industry because it means jobs. And when we looked at the bills, we found that those bills where labor was aligned with oil and gas were the ones that the majority of lawmakers did vote in favor or at least in alignment with oil and gas. Bottom line, oil and gas has a much better track record on bills when they can team up with labor on those bills in California. Connecting all the dots and seeing through some of the assumptions. Julie Watts, thank you very much. Now back to the presidential election. Pop singer Chapel Roan says she will vote for Vice President Kamala Harris. This after receiving some harsh criticism for saying she was reluctant to endorse a candidate in the 2024 presidential race. Roan has taken to TikTok not once but twice in the past two days to defend this position. No, I'm not voting for Trump. And yes, I will always question those in power and those making decisions over other people. I'm sorry that you fell for the clickbait. The hot to go singer acknowledged that she doesn't agree with how the Democratic Party has dealt with the war in Gaza, while also speaking out against Republican policies. Roan has regularly advocated for trans rights. That does it for today. We will be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. The Daily Report with John Dickerson starts right now.